Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me clearly? Thank you so much for coming uh, for this session of Change Makers. Firstly, I'd like to say that we're so thrilled that we could do this session on campus. Uh, we were hoping to do one last month as well, but uh, COVID. So thank you so much for making it here today. And let me introduce our change maker for this month. I think you all know him, to use a cliche, doesn't really need an introduction, but let me introduce TM Krishna to you. Uh, one of the country's finest Karnatic vocalists. He's a writer, he's an activist, and I would say one of the country's conscience keepers, someone who isn't afraid to speak out on issues that matter. And that's particularly important at this time uh, when the country is, is, is facing all kinds of headwinds uh, from all over the place. And we're going to talk about that uh, in just a moment. But also very few artists uh, often end up taking a stand on issues that matter to people. And TM Krishna is one of those uh, voices who, who does take a stand uh, on, on critical issues and, and you know, isn't afraid to call a spade a spade. So thank you, TM Krishna, thank for so coming much. to Vizag. Thank you, Nidhi. Really thank nice you to all. See you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. So the idea of the Change Maker series is for our students to get to know you, the person, better, more beyond the public persona that we are aware of. So, I'll go to the beginning. Tell us about your childhood. What was that like? Oh, my childhood was, first of all, uh, it's lovely to see so many people live. Uh, that's, that itself live. is a, <laughs> I mean like, live. I didn't mean like, you know what Yeah, I mean. yeah. Sorry. In person. Sorry, in person. <laughs> uh, whoops. That's a good way to start a discussion. But uh, yeah, so I, I grew up in, I mean, very honestly, I grew up in great convenience and privilege. So I come from a family of, uh, Basically, business people uh, on my father's side. Uh, my mother's side, my grandfather was a doctor, one of the first to head out to Manipal when Manipal was first started. He was in the first great war as a doctor. So, uh, but we're not a music musician's family. Typically, musicians usually come from some hereditary practice. Yeah. That's not the case here. My mother does sing, she graduated in music apart from English. Uh, there was interest in music. Yes, my paternal side, my grand uncle was T. Krishmachari, the finance minister, I mean, at one time, the finance minister of India, but also the founder of the Madras Music Academy. So there is a lot of art interest, but no musician really in the family. So, so how did you start? Because you were very young when you started. Yeah, the story goes that, is that when I was three or four, when my mother was trying to revive her musical interest after I was born, I showed some spark, you know that word spark. <laughs> I don't believe any of it, but so I showed some spark and she put me in what in, in Tamil Nadu we'll call party class or music class. And um, when I was about 12, 11 or 12, they felt that I could sing a concert. So that was my first concert, I was 12 years old. <clears throat> but I never really wanted to be a musician, that's the truth. My dream by the time I got to high school was economics. I wanted to be an economist. I wanted to go to D school and then I had my trajectory to LSC as if they're going to give me admission, but that was my dream. <laughs> but my dream was to be an economist and I still love the subject and still follow it. So I never thought I'll be a musician. Um, it was, I think, late 80s, uh, no, I was in call, early 90s uh, when I sang a few concerts and like seniors came and said, you know, why are you not taking this seriously? My colleagues said, you know, you should pursue music. It's, uh, you're, you're talented. That's why it first struck me that this could be something I will, can do like full time. But, um, so that's when, as I finished college, I spoke to my dad. And like I said, I think the fact is also I came from privilege. I came from economic privilege, social privilege. So I could take a chance. You know, taking a career in, in music at that time was even crazier. People said, you know, are you sure? You know, you can't make, get food on the table. But because of the privilege, my father actually said, give it a shot. If it didn't work, go back to study. And that's how I landed up in music, actually. But there's an interesting lesson, I think, for many students here as well, that often we, we set these life goals for ourselves and we think that there is a certain path we have to follow. And the thing is that life does throw you opportunities where, you know, the trajectory is completely different. It happened no, with you. Absolutely. And I think there is something about that gut. Mm. You know, there's that feeling, that draw. Never ignore it. 
you know, the con your situation, your environment may give you a signal that say that you cannot do it. Yes. But don't ignore that feeling. And I think for me, music was that. You know, I got that feeling in my stomach when I sang. I just knew this is something I could do 24 hours. We used to practice with friends, like from 9 p.m. till 6 a.m. Not because we had a concert. You didn't do it because I was going to sing a concert. You just did it because you were passionately in love with it and it did something to you. Never ignore that feeling. Even if you don't do it today, never ignore it. Because from there comes regret. You, maybe your situation, maybe your context doesn't allow you to pursue it today next one year or two years. But keep that alive, keep that burning. And I think that's something that I was able to do even though I never thought I'd be a musician. Even when economics was what I thought I'm going to do, I knew this feeling was real. I knew I, when, I, when I sang, I had a smile. I didn't care whether other people had a smile or not. You know, when I practiced, I got, it, I said there must be madness. But to have your family support, the support of your parents, that would have made a big difference. Exactly. What like I you said. said, it was a crazy choice. Ooh, Everyone yeah. at that time wanted their kids to be doctors and engineers yeah. and pretty much still do. Still do, exactly. Yes. <laughs> so, so to take Chartered accountancy too. <laughs> exactly. So, so there you go, chartered accountancy is at number three. Yeah. So, you know, to get their support. But tell me, what was the kind of discipline that was required uh, in terms of how your day was as, as a student? You know, you had to obviously do your academics. Yeah. So what, what was the kind of practice involved? How many hours a day were you so, practicing? See, you know, this, this time is a very interesting thing, right? We always think we don't have time. But when we do something we are in love with, we have time. I mean, how does it happen? It's the same. If you look at the clock, it's still 60 minutes. It's not changed, right? But somehow you seem to have time when you want to do something. It's similar for me. I'm not a very organized person. Let me stretch. I'm not a guy who can say from 9 to 11, I'll do this. I, it just doesn't work for me. But you just made time. You just did it. You had an exam. You studied for it because you just had to do it. And then at the same time, so there is this other thing that happens in India, right? Once students get to 8th grade, ninth grade, all of the activities will be shut out. Yeah. That's the stupidest thing we could do in our lives. There's nothing stupider than that. And if there are, I know there are parents here, please don't do that to your children. Please don't do that. Professors, I know you think I figured it out. You have not. Don't, the, don't do that to your children. Please don't. Let them go for their sports. Let them play what they're doing. Let them play on the street. Please. Because you don't know what life is going to offer them. And ultimately, you know, this is crazy. We are all, I mean, I'm a parent too. That's why I'm saying this so confident, confidently. You know, we I say all this, at the same time, we'll say all we want is our children to be happy. We are lying. <laughs> we want our children to be like us or better than us as we have decided what is better than us. So that has to change, right? So I somehow, you know, I had, I had friends who also sang and they were all much older than me, like at least eight, nine years older than me. But they were all kind enough to take me under their wing, this young guy, irritating young boy, who would just keep coming and asking questions and say, can we sing this, can we sing that? So we used to just jam. I was not even singing so many concerts then. It was not. I was not some recognized as this young talent to that to great extent. But they used to just sit with me, we used to just sing. We'll take a raga and we will sing. If we went to a concert that evening and uh, we didn't like the way we sung especially, then we'll say, no, we have to and both of us will sit and sing 2 a.m., 3 a.m., go out, grab some chai, come back, sing. And, and then if you had to go to college, I went to college. You know, and that's, I think that commitment to, to doing something important to yourself and beautiful. And what you're passionate it about. It needs to be there. Yeah. It needs to be there. So I had, of course, like you said, family support. So, but it requires, just to get back to what you said, it requires a rigor. I know I do I don't want to ignore that part of rigor you know sometimes in this airy fairy follow your dreams we sometimes forget that there is discipline there I had to make sure my throat my voice can do what my mind says first of all everybody says be creative what does it mean <laughs> we don't know right when I say be creative what does it mean do something new what does it mean in our respective fields we actually don't know what it means we just like saying that. So we'll just put some special color there, put some special graphic there. It's, no, it's not creative. That's just, just faking yourself and faking the other person. So what does it mean to be creative? Part of that process 
is also knowing your body, knowing your voice. In my case, knowing your voice, knowing what, what it can do. What does it mean to have an idea and make that idea something actually here? So if I have a musical idea, what is, it, what is the transference of that idea into a voice, into a tune, into a composition? How do I, how do I emote? How do I emote? How do I make you cry? How do I make you laugh? So all this requires rigor, discipline, repetition of things that you may dislike doing. You repeat it 100 times. So was it like uh, a day where school for eight hours, six hours or whatever, and then four hours of musical training? It could be or it, it could so be my, cla my music classes, official classes, my teacher all through then was Bhagutala Sitaram Sharma uh, from here, from Kuchipudi. And uh, his, we used to have classes thrice a week. Friday, Wednesday, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 5 p.m. Classes were only one and a half hours. Okay. That's it. But you had to But practice. then I, I had to work seven days a week. So because I'll have to come back to the next class. And those were days, remember, uh, it sounds like I'm old. Maybe I am. But uh, those were times. We're almost the same yeah, age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, so I, I'll pause there. I'll pause there. I'll <laughs> drop it. So there was a time when I didn't have a music book. Okay. So I still remember this. I used to go to class and I used to just sing. And if you were taught a new song, for example, only way you can remember it is keep, as soon as you leave the class, you keep singing it for the next one hour in your head. You just have to keep singing it because you will forget it for sure. So next one hour, we will not talk to anybody. If you're going back home and you're walking, keep on singing it. Okay. And then, so you, I didn't have something called a music book for almost seven years of my training. I didn't have any book. My teacher never told me there is a book. After seven years, you've learned a lot. Now get a book. Huh? I didn't know how to write a song. I didn't know how to read. Uh, I didn't know. I just How to read music? No. I didn't know. If you gave me notations, I would know what to do with it. But I could remember. So you had to just work, work. So that one hour after class, you're working. Then as you progress, you're then looking into spaces where you need to find your identity in the music. Where is T.M. Krishna and the singing? That's when you go to spaces of exploration. And then it was not just my teacher. It was friends. It was slightly senior colleagues. We will all sit and just sing. We would be on street corners. Crazy. At that time, it was crazy. Young people arguing about a raga was kind of <laughs> ridiculous. right? You could talk about a film song and argue about Ile Raja maybe. But we'll be sitting in the street corner and we'll be saying, you know, then that raga, that phrase you sang was rubbish, man. <laughs> and everybody's like, what are these guys doing? So, but we had that. that, that so, what time. did you study in college eventually? Economics, of course. <laughs> so what did. else would I study? <laughs> so, you did I that. I graduated in economics and I then You did that. well? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to put it in context, when my daughter saw my grades, she was like, oh, oh. <laughs> but even better, I have a little story. So I had this young girl. Um, so my wife, Sangeeta Shivakumar, is also a musician. Uh, but she was also one of these school topper types, right? Not me. So this young girl came for uh, advice, came to our house and parents brought her. I don't think she wanted to come. I said, no, no, you, you came to me. I said, you have to give her advice because she's passionate about music. But she's also this school topper. And, uh, you know, you have to give her advice on what to do and all that. And I say, yeah, yeah, okay, you bring her over. She was sitting and talking. We spoke about 20 minutes. And then by mistake, I told her, do you know what I got in my 10th grade math model? I won't tell you what I got. I know you want to know. I won't tell you. But I said, do you know? And it was really bad. You won't believe. Next second, she lost all respect for me. <laughs> and then I told her, she, my wife is a topper. The only person she spoke to for the next one hour was her. So uh, I managed in college. I did decently. I was not, I was not brilliant, but I did decently. But I, I realized at that point of time, I had to make a choice. I couldn't pursue economics and music. So I had to make a choice and say, if I was going to take up music, then it has to be uh, a full-time happening. It can't be part-time. So, you know, you mentioned that, you know, here you were a, uh, a teenager and, you know, arguing with friends about ragas. And often Carnatic music is associated with, and, and I'm saying this with utmost respect. You can say it with disrespect. Yeah. I have no problem with that. <laughs> but, you know, that there is a certain demographic, uh, our parents and our grandparents, oh, is, yeah. you know, and it's not something that young people necessarily no. associate with. Now, is that a myth? Is that something that you can say credibly today is, is, is a myth? No, I can't say it's a myth. Uh, it's true? Well, it is true. Let's be 
let's be frank about it. But there, there are layers to this, and I just want to just maybe untravel them. So I don't have a problem. See, everything need not be mass first. You know, everything need not be consumed by a million people. Uh, and that's not how the world operates, and that's not how culture operates. So you have things that maybe only five villages somewhere understand, right? The problem for me is not the number game, but the demography game and the diversity of people involved in this art form. That is a big problem, and that's a social problem. Carnatic music is a Brahmin constricted art form, and there is no denying this. I mean, you can go to history, I can discuss history. You've written about it. Yeah, I've written about it extensively. I mean, we cannot deny this. And there are social reasons for it. It's our society which is the problem. Our society is divided by caste, gender, and all these hierarchies. And if we say that is culture, we need to rethink our culture. That is not culture. Our culture is trapped within social limitations. Every culture in the world is trapped within its social limitations. So you have to question those structures. Carnatic music is stuck. And that is my problem. So my interest is, say if there are 50 people at my concert, I don't care that there are 50 people. I'm saying, are there 50 people from diverse cultural backgrounds in that concert, diverse genders in that concert? That is interesting. That doesn't exist. And this is true of all so-called, I say so-called, because I hate the word classical, so-called classical art forms in the world. They are all constricted by social paradigms. Western classical music is white music. Very elite. It yeah. is white elitism, and yeah. that is a social construct. Indian classical music is casteist, without doubt. It ha it's, it's building its entire so-called, it's very difficult to understand, only some people understand. All the stories I've heard. Okay, let some people understand. Can the some people be from different backgrounds? That's the question. That's a different question. This is an issue which is true of Hindustani music, which is true of Carnatic music, which is true of classical forms in, in other parts of Asia. So this, I, I'll give you, there's a, there was a fabulous musicologist called uh, Harold Powers. And uh, many, many years ago, he's no more, he became a dear friend to it at the end of his life. And he came home, and this was much before I had even started thinking about these issues. Um, he had come home, and he was having coffee, and I said, Harold, I have a question for you. I said, what's the difference between folk and classical? Anyone wants to answer that? Does anybody here know? I know we all have, we all think we know, so go ahead. Even I thought I knew. What's the difference between folk and classical? Anybody, come on. Not the professors. <laughs> Students only. Anyone? They're conferring amongst themselves. You're telling each other you can tell me. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I, can, I saw the hand. Can we get a mic? One sec, we just wait for the mic. It's just coming to you. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Can other ones, other guys keep quiet for a second, please. Thanks. I think folk music is more, uh, how do I put it? It's more cultural, I'd say. Um, it, it varies from your culture to like. OK. It, and uh, classical music, in my opinion, it is more, uh, there's a, uh, there's a strict. Uh, can this, I try? Can yeah, I try helping? Distinct. Can I try helping you? Yes. Are you saying it's more codified? Yes. Yes. It's more. It's more codified. Okay. That's what it's saying, right? Okay. So these are. This is. This is a reply that I expect. Like culture, uh, folk music is more varied. It's among the people. It is less rigid. It doesn't require as much practice. It's in some ways the flip side is not as sophisticated. Is not as complex. It's simple, right? All these are lies. <laughs> Don't believe anybody who tells you this because they have not, these people who tell you this have actually not invested time in any one form that is called folk. Their folk music understanding is what they see on television or they sing at home. Right? Harold gave me a beautiful answer. He said, whenever folk, folk music or folk arts go up the social ladder, they become folk to classical. So what determines classical is who participates in it, but not the form. There are so many, so I think one I thing I want to add here is, there are musical forms or art forms that I will call social music, right? Occupational music. Songs that are sung during harvest. Uh, lullabies that are passed around from, from, from parents to next generations. But there are also organized art forms in different parts of society. For example, there is kutu. In Andhra, there is kutu. 
okay or kut uh, with puppetry or for example lavani in in maharashtra or you know i can go on these are structured art forms which we call folk they require training they require discipline they require understanding of text they have sophistication but we will never call that classical and there's only one reason for it who participates in it who determines it but you you will call what i sing classical without even understanding one line of what i'm singing so that's got nothing to do with music does it what was the reaction in the music fraternity uh, when you yeah exactly like when you when you sort of wrote about this and 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 you know you've been very vocal on this issue i'm sure there must have been a back there is and there they continues to be and, uh, there will be for some time see i mean uh, the is these the issues that i brought up honestly were not some new things it's not like uh, people didn't know it existed the people just didn't speak about it right it was i mean i believed probably if you met tm krishna in 1997 tm krishna would be one of the guys arguing with this tm krishna saying i'm talking rubbish so let me also be honest is that i have changed i went through a whole process of understanding who i am what do i represent who do i scare why do i scare why do people respect me without even knowing who i am why should they respect me why do i disrespect people so easily based on what sound they produce based on what dress they wear based on so many things right so when i raised these things i think the problem was it came from an insider insider with power that became a major issue because i was by then whatever a star within that world and of course there has been there was backlash um there was uh, the seniors were very upset they said to you you know he's uh, what who said of course they will name 10 ka carnatic musicians who come from other communities i know all the 10 names and say isn't there this person isn't there that person but nobody has gone and spoken to that person and asked them what was your life like what was it is like men saying all women are equal no <laughs> without asking women what are the difficulties of you trying to say that you are equal right it's the same story and then there were organizations who refused to invite me there have been great friends colleagues who have shared stages with me who have refused to share the stage with me anymore we are not friends anymore uh, so all kinds of backlash all kinds of uh, counter movement but the fact also is that i was powerful enough to take it if i was a nobody i would have been thrown out by now i wouldn't be having this discussion with you but how did that uh, awareness come and i ask because as you said in the beginning that you you had a life of privilege uh, and and you grew up in that privilege so um, how did this awareness about caste discrimination how did that happen with you yeah, i i this question is asked and i always give a vague answer i'll give you a vague answer because i it's very difficult for me to articulate this it's just something that i get here like i said here and i my simple answer it's music gave it to me it sounds it sounds a lot like mambo jumbo when i say it but let me try and say it i think every one of us in this room have moments when you watch a play or when you watch a movie you can listen to music or when you just take a walk when somehow for like about 30 seconds 10 seconds something happens and you feel you're a better person that some way you're not limited by who you are what you are where do i come from right or on both sides both on the side of feeling maybe better about yourself or maybe feeling lesser about yourself when all that disappears and you're able to receive life or sunrise or say the water is here quite beautiful i think the great thing about art and art is entirely a creation of human being art is what we created art is not naturally there in the world we decided it something is art i think the most incredible thing about art is human beings realized that there is a way in which we can tap into that slightly better aspect of us mm. right whether it's through a painting whether it's through a song whether it is through a design whether it's through movement whether it's through sculpture and i think that what happened to me is when i even when i was singing in the 90s late 90s i remember there were moments when i sang you know a performer is always in control i am in complete control of what is happening and i need to be in control of you guys right so at one level this is a game i always say we do very good puppetry I, you know what i mean so 
I know, for example, what you need. I know, for example, which to push when. I know when to make you feel this way. So in a way, you are trapped in my world of design, and the better I am, I manipulate it better. It's still pleasurable, right? I found that when I was singing, sometimes the best experiences for me is when I was not in control of this. When I was not doing this little game. And that used to bother me. Because how is that possible? I'm a master of my, my skill, my, my music. And, but I seem to feel that there's something better happening to me when I'm not in control of this, when I'm not aware of who I am. So this is not some outer body experience. This is a very literal happening. And I kept digging that for myself. And those openings basically for me said, if you can be slightly better for 20 seconds and not be like that, can you be better when you are not on stage and singing or not singing? Which meant I had to show a mirror to who I am. To yourself, yeah. And that mirror said all the things I don't like to face. And that's when my, my, my gender, my, my caste, my every privilege popped up and I was asking complex questions of myself. So many of the things I say in public are actually as much directed towards myself. Because my privilege is never going to go away. I can talk about it till I die, but I'm still going to benefit from it. That's the whole trap. Like, white person can keep talking all through his life about how you need equality, but he dies as a white person. A man can keep on saying, you know, yeah, yeah, feminism, feminism, all this. I'm still a damn man. A Brahmin can keep on saying that, you know, no, no, there should be no caste. But the privileges that you accrue because you're Brahmin and because of what that caste gives in social respectability, it's not economic. People want the most thing in life is respect. And caste, unfortunately, in our country is a hierarchy of respects. Yeah. And that's the problem. Very well said. Very, very well said. Yeah. I'd like to open uh, up questions from the students and other members of the audience before I ask, because I have a lot of questions. But uh, raise your hand, please, if you have any questions for Mr. Krishna, and then we'll get a mic to you. Yes, in the corner there. I see two hands, so both of you can ask. Maybe I'll see three if I do this. That side. Um, good morning, sir. Introduce uh, yourself. I am uh, Manasa. I'm a fourth year student of computer science. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm 22 years old. Um, I used to be, I used to sing when I was 14, uh, 13, 14. And uh, my dad got me a teacher, a guru. Um, but I figured that it was not my cup of tea. And um, I stopped learning music altogether, but then I figured that, uh, you know, when I came into computer science that I absolutely hated this and I should have <laughs> gone for arts instead. <laughs> <laughs> you, what's, you hated which? Computer science. Computer science. I have a question. Which year are you in? Fourth year. Okay, all the best. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I probably will need a lot of that. Considering I'm graduating in two months, thankful for that. Well, uh, should have taken arts. But what my father said was, um, music especially, is number one, like you said, a caste-dominated field. And um, number two, it's a male-dominated field. And if I do go there, uh, I would somehow have to sell my morality. Uh, if Oops. I Yes, he, he did say that. Because, well, um, unlike you, I do not come from a family of privilege. And uh, it, it hurt very much when he said that music is closed off to certain, you know, strata. So how uh, it took me a lot of years to figure that out and then but now I want to get into music. I don't know if I'll be able to sing well. Is that possible? Is it possible for a 22-year-old to start learning music? Okay, first of all, uh, uh, I just want to uh, really thank you for your honesty because it's not easy to be so honest. And I, I, I'm saying this very, very generally to you. It's far easier for me to be honest, well. which is why I'm telling you that. So thank you very much. Yeah, really. Truly, truly, I mean this. 
Um, actually, it saddens me to hear your story, very honestly, because I can't refute anything you said point blank. I wish I could, but I can't. But there, I think uh, two, three things. Yes, it is caste dominated. It is, shall we say, the restriction is, you can sit down, don't stand. And, and you know the, the restriction that's so people can ask uh, because she's used that word I just want to take that uh, point the restrictions are always invisible the restrictions are not like you have a lock and key and you lock the door and you go away the restriction is inculcated in culture that's why culture is also care you have to be careful about it right so can somebody access it like I mean do you feel you're welcome there do you feel you can even come there? So it's like my mother runs a school for tribal children. And it's not enough if you open the school, the school there. How does the person living there know they can come inside that school? Yeah. That's the problem. And that's where the restrictions are. And that's where the restrictions which your dad pointed to are also there. And that's the point. Now, the morality aspect, I think that is not uniquely special of the music world. That's unfortunately the situation of society in general, of what is expected of a woman or, or what liberties can be taken. Maybe that's a better way to put it, right? And that, that's true, I think, unfortunately, in this misogynistic male society, in many places, uh, this is faced. Um, so can a 22-year-old learn music? Of course, yes. There's, there's no, no doubt about it. Is it harder? Yes. That's undeniable. See, one of the things we forget is that many people who want to learn music, forget that they did 12 years of schooling and then went to college. So it's 15 years of training, actually, right? So somehow you think that music, three years, it'll happen. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Just like it's easier for you to learn ABCD when you are much younger, it's easier to learn Sarigama when you're much younger. That's a, that is just a reality of physiology and the mind. But does that mean you cannot learn it when you're 22? Definitely not. Is it harder? Yes, it's harder physically, it's harder intellectually, it is harder. But you definitely should learn music. Don't, definitely go and find a teacher. And if you don't, email tmkrishnaofficial at gmail.com and I will get my office to get you a teacher. Did you get the email address? It's tmkrishnaofficial at gmail.com. No underscores dots. That's really, that's very sweet. Um, yes, sir, please. Uh, good morning, sir. My name is Kuldeep. So uh, I am a 2021 passed out from the same college. I am here exclusively for your session. Thank you for coming. So your book, Sebastian and Sons, Sons brought me here. Uh, so my question here is, uh, especially all the people movements uh, are driven by art more or less, for instance, like especially in the Tal Telangana separate state movement or in the North and Andhra peace and revolution, all were like driven by, especially by Jananatya Mandali, which is like Correct. a proper folklore art, which comes from the masses. So whereas like, where do you see Carnatic music in that genre, like in that place where it is completely restricted to one particular community or for instance, for instance, I can, I, I really enjoy Carnatic music, but I find it very difficult to understand. Like it is very too difficult for me to understand. Though Tyagraj Kritis are all the five are in Telugu, but I, I find it very difficult to understand. So where do you find Carnatic music, like which can educate, organize, and uh, drive down people movements? Ha! Huh. So you're asking a political question. You're saying can Carnatic music, for example, be part of mass political uh, movement? So I mean. Uh, this, is a, this is a very good question, a tough one. See, first of all, all musical forms don't have the same intention of their being. First, let's get this. This music is universal, music is everything, is a generic statement that makes sense to some extent. But we can't take it to the extreme. I like to use the word intentionality. Every musical form has a certain structure that gives it an intention. Right? So when Nidhi is anchoring a show, she has an intention as an anchor. Right? There's a difference between what she will do when there is a camera in front of her and when both of us are having this conversation here. Those are two different intentions in space itself. Right? So every art form has an intention. So Jananatya Sangeeta or Jananatya movements have an intention. I always say that, uh, that religious music and, and political music are the same. And I'll tell you why. Okay? This is an aesthetic point. 
So if you take any religious music in the world, in the world, as a musical observer, I'll observe one thing, two things. One, the lyrics will be simple, that everybody can repeat. Yeah. Two, the tunes will be repetitive, so that congregationally you can sing. This is as true of every political song you will hear, of mass movement. Tunes, so that people can sing. And then there'll be accents on specific words. If it's religious, on some God thing. If it's political, on some ideology. Okay? So actually, those have a, so the intention there is to create a form that can carry forward that need. Right? So every art form has a politics of a different nature, is what I'm trying to tell you. So when I, for example, in my repertoire over the last decade, there are a lot of directly political things that I sing about. But I cannot sing about it in this form with, shall we say, the, the, the kind of direct power that you will find in political, direct political music. Because that form is different. So I will use a different medium. I will subvert it differently. I may have to bring in more complex conversations here where that other person is not interested in complex conversations. He wants to say, you know, do this, do this, let's get together and do this. I'll probably say, can we do this or that? Right? So the, there are these differences between how every art form, there is no art form which is not political. By saying I don't speak about politics, I'm being political. So when Carnatic musician says that Carnatic music is not political, they're lying through their teeth. Because everything that you're saying is saying who you are, no? It's also saying who you want, no, don't want to be. That's political. So I think every form needs to have its own method of political action. So we did this song called the Porumboka Padal. Uh, can I take a few minutes? Yeah, please. So we did this song called the Porumboka Padal. It's on YouTube, you can go see it. Uh, it was an interesting experiment because it connects with your, his question. Is uh, in the north of Chennai, like in every city in the world, there are certain sections of society uh, that are marginalized. And the worst things that we do want, uh, want to be built will be built in that, those places. Thermal power stations, chemical factories, yeah. fertilizer factories, will be all built in places where our marginalized Dalits live. This is the reality of every part of India, every city of India. So this part of uh, then Madras used to be called, by the way, Black Town, by the whites. Okay? So here we have four thermal factories. Thousands of acres of marshland have been made ash ponds. Uh, a river called Kosas Talayar is now pretty much oil. People suffer, struggle, fisher folk. It's a, it's a mess. It's actually a, a, a criminal site, if you want to be honest. So there was this whole idea of can we make a song for it. There was already a song, this song, and there had already been a Tamil rock version of it. Uh, a colleague of mine with whom we worked together, he came and said, can you do something in Karnatic with this? And this was an interesting idea for many things. How many of you know what Poramboka means? Ah, only one. He knows Tamil. That's why he knows it. Okay, those who know. So Poramboka, by the way, in Tamil is an abuse word. Oh. So I thought I'll let in a little later. Now everybody's I've chattering, right? <laughs> okay. So Poramboka basically means good for nothing, useless fellow. So if you come to Chennai, always say, come to Chennai, get into an auto, don't play the auto guy what he asks for, he'll call you a Puramboka. <laughs> okay? So Puramboka has become, but actually it's not an abuse word, that's the whole thing. The English parallel for Puramboka is commons, or that which is shared by society, does not have ownership. So your lake is Puramboka, your forests are Puramboka, your, in fact your roads which all of us walk in is Puramboka. It belongs to us, right? Belongs to all of us. You can't say somebody cannot walk on that road. So imagine such a beautiful word has become an abuse word. Why did it become an abuse word? Very simple reason. When the British came, they wanted to tax. So they taxed all private property. Porumboka does not belong to anybody. There was no revenue. So useless land. Porumboka became useless. So even today when you buy land in most places, if you go for agricultural land, the, the agent will say, sir, two acres uh, regular, sir, half an acre Porambok, sir. <laughs> Basically means it's been taken away from common property. So this song starts with an abuse word. Imagine Carnatic music starting with an abuse word. That was the first interesting thing for me. Two, it was talking 
in, in the written language was Chennai's local dialect. What everybody in Chennai will speak on the street was the language. Again, the classical will never use the language of the local people. It will use the elite dialect. It was an interesting experiment. Third, it was political. It was making direct statements about what is happening in Chennai. So can we sing this in Karnatic? It was a fascinating project for me. Aesthetically fascinating, politically. So I got a friend of mine and said, can you tune this? And we tuned this in proper Carnatic ragas. <laughs> Absolutely. It's as Carnatic as it can get. Nobody who knows Carnatic music can ever argue with me on that one. But to your answer, to your question, it is possible. But that's a different form of politicization. A different form of making political statements. So that is why it's important that even in art fields that are among elite, conversations have to become diverse, which means diverse people have to be involved. You are, that's given me an opening to ask you about, you know, your political positions, uh, which I'm, like I said in the beginning, you're very outspoken. Uh, you were uh, very visible during the anti-CAA protests. You, uh, you, you've never been afraid to take a stand. When you look at what's happening in the country today, where, you know, we are in the midst of this fight about hijab and, you know, it's very obvious that certain communities are being singled out and are being targeted. Um, how do you feel about India at this crossroads? Horrible. I, I, I cried the, 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 during the hijab thing. I actually broke down at home. I, 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 didn't, I didn't have anybody to speak to. I was just sitting at home and I was crying. And uh, I was crying simply because just the depths of, of hate that we have consumed ourselves with, that there is no sanity possible. I include myself in that. You know, I, I'm, you know, I'm also participating in that hate in some manner. I'm also participating in that inability to have a conversation in that manner. That you can't just be who you are. You know? And there was, I mean, I'm not saying the past was great. It was not. We all had problems. But many of these things happened organically. These conversations happened within and, and there were ways in which communities found their pathways if they could. But now we just want to hate each other. We just want to say something ugly about that. There's pleasure being derived by deriding uh, certain communities. Pleasure being derived by saying that, you know, saying that, you know, my faith or my way of faith, maybe that's even better, is the ultimate in the world. The, you know, there's nothing else. Everybody is ugly. Every other faith is there to... To, to kill me, kill my way of living. I mean, the, can't we at least be conscious that such a discourse is targeted at making us worse people? Forget about ideologies. Can't we even see we become worse people? I have become a worse person. I have become a worse person in the last year, few years. Can't we see that for ourselves? You disagree. You argue. You have a different opinion. No problem. But if you're going to carry this, uh, this cult, this is actually constructed anger, constructed hate. People want you to hate. Can you see that? They want you to, just, just look at all of us today. Because of all this controversy, now when you walk on the street, when you, when you see hijab, do you just walk? Or does your eye turn for another two seconds? It does. For all of us, including me. 20 days ago, I would have probably not noticed and said, that's that person's life. But now I'm looking. Now, what am I thinking when I'm looking? Do I know? I'm thinking so many things. I'm judging that person. I'm presuming that person is trapped in patriarchy. I'm presuming so many things. I think this has to go. And my greatest fear for younger people is this hate. Not governments, not individuals. Is what do we do to... What do we do about this hate? And that's where I want to work. Is there something, and I think this is cultural. This is where we have to work. What can we do? You mean a civil society? Yes, that's where our work is. Because the greatest damage is done here. It will happen for a decade that we're going to hate each other. We're going to suspect, be suspicious of each other. We th always think somebody is at us. Some our culture is being destroyed. What is this our culture? Can one person explain this to me in this country. I don't know. I sing what is probably considered most of this culture. And I still don't know what this culture is. What is this culture? When we say we want to protect culture, there is only cultures in this country. There is never one culture. It's plural. 
and it's plural not in community basis it's plural within roads within streets within localities so that worries me deeply i'm very bothered by that that we need to speak to young people we need to sorry correct myself we need to listen to young people because again what young people are not being listened to and this is and i i will say all of us are culpable it's happening at homes it's happening in, in institutions it's happening in schools it's happening everywhere instead of saying don't succumb to hate we are also saying look at that person that has to change you know do you ever feel or does your family ever worry when you speak out so openly on issues you're very i mean you're very sort of open in targeting the bjp and and what you think of the leadership um, do you ever worry about well uh, what will happen i'm not a super super star to be so worried but uh, but nevertheless uh, no uh, but was, we, we we've seen people in civil society yeah i mean it has yeah. happened before and yeah there was times when there were threats of attack and all that yeah my pair, my family i mean i didn't have a cell phone for 7 years okay i gave up the cell phone way before whatsapp and i one of the reasons i got a private phone was because of that because uh, my wife and my parents said you know we just need to know what's happening with you uh, because we don't know and there were threats and i had to uh, there was a month when i had to go everywhere with security and all this rubbish but um, yeah it is it's let's be honest here all the bravado kept aside you are scared once in a while how can you deny it you are scared when i have to go to a concert my own concert three roads from my home with bouncers it's the most ridiculous thing i had to go to my own concert with bouncers in my car because there was a threat of attack to the venue and nobody was willing to help at that point of time so it is scary it's not only scary for you you're scared for your colleagues on stage you're scared for your your, your family you're scared for your children you're scared now if somebody disagrees with me that's fine but if somebody is going to attack me that's not fine that is not fine but it's scary but i think it's one of those things you pass through and then but you don't you find yourself self censoring your you know as a result of this i think we are all self censoring i i to some I, extent i we are all self censoring anybody says they are not they are like because we are all we are all doing it in our own grades depending on what we think we can survive right uh, i think we're all doing that little uh, balancing trick of saying okay let's push till here let's hold back now let's open it up so it's not it's half strategy but it's more or less it is like you know do you want to go through that again you know do you really want to do you want to face that again and yeah i think we are all self serving that is that's again people when they talk about freedom of expression in this country they'll say what is this mr krishna saying is sitting here with nidhi and say you know saying these things that this is not the problem the problem is what we are not saying to urban naxals yes exactly <laughs> urban naxals we are not saying because we are scared or we are doubtful maybe scared we are doubtful imagine that multiplied by every individual it affects your creativity it affects the way you dream it affects where you will go it affects what chances you'll take in life it affects everything it's not just about what you say it's more about what you don't want to think what you don't want to say what you don't want to sing what you don't want to dance what you don't want to write that's the scary part very honest very honest and upfront as always let's take a few more questions we still have a few minutes yeah. left yes please i'll come to the back as well after this yeah we'll come to you Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, I am P. Shankar Rao, uh, faculty in Computer Science and Engineering Department. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, the culture uh, uh, is creating somewhat uh, uh, a difference a difference in the people. I I agree with you, but in other sense, the culture gives some rules and regulations for the community. Uh, otherwise, if there is no cultural things, so people feel very voluntarily or individualistic, and which may create the problems so i think uh, the culture creation by the ancestors is one of the root causes or what i believe is the culture gives the people of that community or that group some rules and regulations how to live how to uh, how to 
uh, go with the values, traditions, etc. So what do you say on this? So first of all, I mean, I mean, there are a lot of questions to be asked. I mean, this is probably a two-hour discussion, what you've asked me. But this, suppose your rules and regulations tells you that you're better than somebody else. Will you still follow that rule and regulation? Yeah, so... Oh, no, no, no. I, I just, if your rules and regulations say that you're better than some other community, and that community is only worthwhile to do some job, Will you follow your rules and regulations? Yeah, so I don't agree that extreme uh, points of uh, the culture. No, but, but one second, that so is also tradition, sir. But no, no, hang on. Uh, let me, let me, you may not. So now you are saying you will question that culture, correct? Yeah, yeah, right. Huh. So you do agree that yeah. this tradition, yeah. these rules and regulations are not always perfect. Yeah. That you agree? Yeah. Shh. Yeah. So what I say is the traditions are the very rules and regulations that are found by, what formed by the ancestors may not uh, means that these much use that are uh, uh, that are uh, deviated uh, by other people later so it is no no huh. so this uh, i have, i'm going to disagree with you straight yeah. to believe our ancestors did something perfect yeah. in my opinion is is thinking logically illogical nobody could have done anything perfect at any point of time yeah, right right i agree so I agree. one you, you have two things another thing ancestors were working at their time their exposure yeah. their knowledge their access, yeah. whatever, Think, good, evolve. bad. Yeah. So it, it, they did that time. Now I am not going to judge my ancestor. There is no yeah. point. Yeah, right, right. But I will judge what ideas they gave me. Yeah. Because I do believe that, sir, if we all don't have minds to grow on what has come in the past, you will not be doing engineering today. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the only reason you are doing engineering yeah, yeah. is because you challenged many rules that your ancestors put and said that rule is wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't so believe, have, you would also believe you no, I'm just saying that yeah. whatever is in the past, we take, yes. But there are a lot of things in the past that we also need to discard. Now, let me just finish. Yeah. So, first, that is one. Two, to believe there can never be a society, never be a society where people don't live collectively. Yeah. That is a human nature, nothing yeah. to do with culture. Yeah. So, this individualism versus collectivism, right, uh, needs to be taken very carefully. Because we as a species are species of communities. We are species who live with communities. So therefore, if there was no culture, everything will just break down. We will all be uh, selfish. It's not necessarily true. There will always be cultures. There will always be community activity. There will always be community act, uh, sharing. There will be also community violence. My point is, cultures are there. There is only one rule in culture. Always question culture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the only okay. rule. I have to now, move on. I have to move yeah. on. No, 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 please, please. Sir, you've got two questions. I think it's only fair. Uh, there are a couple of students right at the back, two hands up there. Can we get the mic across, please? No, please. Please, sir, no, not We'll come back, I, I, we'll come back, we'll come back. You can have it offline, please. Just to be fair to everybody, we just have a few minutes left. Keep your hands up, those who want the questions. Yes, okay, great. We've got the mic. Good morning, sir. Morning. I'm Gautami. I'm yes. here with, for uh, management students are. So actually in the social era, everyone uh, like uh, in TikToks or Instagram Reels and all, every, every person became across many talents. So I don't even know why the people are so into the group. They are just becoming famous with, a, with only a simple song or something, recently Kacha Badam song. <laughs> and okay, I get it, go ahead. The thing is, do you think that a person needs a trainer or someone to really ex uh, to do master in any art form or especially in music? Uh, this is such a tricky question to answer because I can get hit on both sides if I say anything. <laughs> so, but I will try. You can sit down. Thank you very much. So, uh, this actually, uh, this, this world today has raised many of these questions, right? So, one is, are is art determined by how viral it is, is the first question. If something gets very viral, right, it can be famous, it can be very popular, it can be more popular than the most popular song. But is it art? It's a very complicated question. So I think there is a difference between the two. One, there are of course talents that you, I mean talents that you generally find through Instagram or Facebook or whatever. But there are also cases where things just become viral because they become viral. 
they are nonsensical at times. I'll stick my neck out and say it. They are unmusical, <laughs> but they become viral. Now, that doesn't mean it is art. It can be what I say art like or semblance with art. But it doesn't mean it is art. I, I'm not even questioning it. So the flip side is, say if something does not become viral. Okay, somebody is not so famous. Only 20 people have seen their video. Are they less talented because of that? That's the problem in putting this kind of a number game. This, we are all stuck in likes and this uh, followers and this number game, right? So we are all, I think, somewhere, I mean, art is included. We are all like congested in our head with it. And that's a, in the long term. I'm telling you that's dangerous. Maybe for the next decade, people, something else will replace this number game tomorrow. In that number game, somebody will be more than you. There's always going to be 10 people ahead of you. Always. If you have 1 million followers, there will be some 10 million followers. If 10 million, somebody has 40 million followers. So if you're going to value yourself or what you put out based on that, then there is a problem in art. So yes, you do training, you do need training in whatever art form it is that you are doing. There, there is no question about it. Be, go and ask a physicist what he thinks about small Instagram useless videos. And he says, the physicist will tell you, what nonsense is this, right? It's the same with music. Why is it any different? But it depends on the art form. Then there is, of course, digital. There are certain things done for the digital platform that requires a different kind of training, different kind of understanding. So, yes, the answer is yes, you need to train. But please don't value what you receive on social media based on the number of people. There is social pressure for you to like something because another 10 million people liked it. Please don't fall for it. You don't need to like it. You can like something that has only been seen by two people. Nothing wrong. And you can share it with another 10 people and say, listen to this too. There you're doing something interesting. Yeah, and I, and I think also and, and another important lesson from that is not to let yourself be guided by every like on your own page. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because I think we often judge ourselves that way. Yeah. Now, please feel free to say no for yeah. my next request. But can we ask you to sing a little bit for us? Yeah, no you're, problem. Okay. <laughs> Shall we just take that question and then do it? Yeah, no. after that question and then, a, then, then, then we'll There's somebody behind, no? I'll take that and then yeah. I'll, By then I'll think what to sing. You have a request for singing. Ha, huh, tell me. <laughs> That'll help you think. That helps me. Tell me quickly. Just tell me, only I need to know. You don't need to know. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. So my request is for any artist, there is a point where I thought you ask me for a song. Yes, sir. It okay. is about yeah. the song. For any artist, there is a point where you get inspired by your own art and you start thinking about it in another way. It may be a dance composition for me. It may be a choreographic moment for me. It may be an Annamacharya Sankirtana or a Tyagaraja Kriti for you that made you, that triggered that thought of thinking about the society and the problems oh, that it is Oh, you want that song. There's one song. Huh? So any composition that triggered you that thought You just made my life more difficult. Thank you very much. I'll <laughs> figure it out. Sit down. You ask a question. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. That's the last question and then we'll... Yeah. yeah. So, good morning, sir. Um, what I, I want to ask you something, uh, but before that I want to tell you so, a little bit about my personal experience. So, when I was younger, around four or five years old, I used to take up Carnatic training. And um, over like, as I grew up, we moved places around. Uh, so, I shifted to the north of India and... Um, uh, we could not find Carnatic music teachers there and uh, eventually I had to give up. I mean, I lost touch with Carnatic yeah. music. And uh, as I grew a little older, I got very influenced by Western music. And uh, yeah, to the point where 
I don't like to admit it, but I mean, I do admit it. It's quite. Uh, you don't like Carnatic music. Yeah. Is that what you're struggling to say? There was a yeah, basic. There Come was a, on. No, 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 no. How many people do you think I've met like that there in my life? Phase, there was a phase. I, I used to enjoy singing Carnatic music a lot, but as I grew up and I lost touch with it, uh, I eventually realized that I was not very appreciative of it anymore. But okay. now I am. Now I am. I have to. Yeah. So why do you think that uh, we, as Indians in general, get influenced by Western culture so much? And uh, uh, we have beautiful art right in our country. We have Karna. We have so many forms of music and art. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, I mean, one is that uh, this is a global phenomenon, right? It's not music is universal. Yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> music is universal. So and the thing is that the uh, you can sit down. No, I actually also want to say that uh, I'm actually the vice president of the music club and uh, of Geetam and. Uh, I have a friend here who's very excited and she's freaking out that you're here, by the way. <laughs> well, I can say hi to her. Hi. Thank you. So, uh, well, the fact is that the global world has made certain sounds dominant. So, let's, when we talk about globalization, we often, often only talk about it in, in economic terms or in political terms. We don't talk about it in aesthetic terms. There is aesthetic globalization. Uh, the aesthetic globalization is about what we see as forms of beauty. For example, the whole issue of skin color that we challenge is part of aesthetic globalization of senses of beauty, features, body shape, colors, sounds, everything is part of that what I would call the p corporate power of globalized aesthetic homogeneousness, right? And that is why you will find that, that being accessible more why I was, you know, I was watching some shows on, on, on television the other day, on Netflix. It was some Polish show. It was some the Danish show. Yeah, yeah, and the good. soundtrack is English songs. I mean, there are, I'm sure, rock musicians in Denmark, rock musicians in Poland. Why is there an English soundtrack? There could be a Polish soundtrack. They're all speaking in Polish. Isn't that the same situation? I'm sure there is a Polish rock musician who says, why the hell are you, aren't you using our music? So I'm just saying it's not, no, I am saying this, we often think that this is something that only Indians are being subjugated to. No, this is also global. This is probably happening in Japan. It's happening in Indonesia. It's happening everywhere. So we are not like specially the ones who are being attracted towards that. By the way, when I grew up in school in 80s, we had the same thing. My classmates rather listened to Beatles and The Doors and Simon Garfunkel and all that. So I got exposed to all that kind of music only three. So that we have to handle differently, one. Two, uh, you had said something about uh, not liking and liking Karnatic. You want to say something. There is no compulsion in the world that everyone needs to like Carnatic music. Because you say you like Karnatic, if anybody says they like Carnatic music, does not mean they are more intelligent, does not mean they are more cultured, does not mean they have more sophistication. It just means that they have a different year of listening to something. Full stop. So all I'm saying is can we all be open enough to receive everything? You will still have likes and dislikes. But can we be open enough to receive everything? That will is all I expect of myself and I expect of you. Okay. So we yeah, will now so. leave the floor to you. Okay, I really don't know whether what I can think of a song that triggered me. You made my life even harder. I thought you'd simply say, sing this song. Anyway. Krishna, 
Krishna Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you so much to TM Krishna for, for this session today. It was really wonderful to all of you for coming. Can I ask the pro VC academics to uh, just hand over a little token from sure. us to you? I gave you flowers. We'll <laughs> give you something else. That was so lovely. Thank you. Oh, thanks a ton. Such a pleasure. Thanks. It was really nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I see. Okay. Okay. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks. 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 Here we go.